Hello everyone, General Apple here with another Ghost Pia video. And uh, last video we actually met the cringiest character I have possibly seen in a visual novel. That being said, I haven't played that many visual novels. I'm sure they're way more cringe than that, but still, I barely could bring myself to read his text line. I even skipped a few of his texts because, oh my god, I actually couldn't read it. I cringed to oblivion. So today we're gonna continue right where we left off last time, which is after we met Yor again. So, yeah, hopefully we see as less of this guy as possible. But that being said, we did see some pretty neat stuff. I mean, we may have touched, like, what are we really all about. Like, maybe we're robots and not actually ghosts, so that's pretty interesting. But I guess we need to continue to find out, you know, the exact reason, right? So we kind of touched on the actual real story behind the scenes here, so... I really hope we will finally reach some sort of a, you know, good ending here. Because I have, I truly feel like we read just nonsense until now. Alright. True. Yoro was being held captive under what seemed to be the pretext of a protective custody. In fact, she was provided with a warm room and a huge ham. She was treated so well she didn't even seem aware of the fact that she was being held captive. And then there's the priest's tone of voice. He was afraid of Yoru, but it seems like there was more to it than that. That's right, I talked to the priest, didn't I? I must have been real nervous, since the more time passes, the more the details seem to sink in the, into the back of my mind. I can only just barely make out a rough outline. I was alone at that moment? I don't know, I feel like someone else was there. Hmm. Where did she come from, and why did she come here? There are certain things about her that definitely separate her from us, aren't there? Are you talking about your... Yeah, doesn't it bother you? Huh, not really. Yours never brought up our origins, and I never asked about them. Why not, I wonder? Oh wait, is your one of the officers? That's supposed to, like, watch them? They talk about it. Oh, dear. oh man, that would be actually a great plot twist. Oh, I think I get it. Uh, well, I guess I never really want to ask Yoru since she's the same as me. The same? Yoru and I are both foreigners who came from the outside. I vaguely recognize that this town isn't where we were originally meant to be, but I never really thought about it beyond that. If somebody asked me where I'm really from, that'd probably throw me for a loop. So I don't want to make Yoru feel the same way by asking her the same question. Yeah, I don't remember my past and it sucks to be asked about something you don't remember, you know? Okay, so what's different between me and Yoru? I'm an outsider in this town, but it doesn't look like I suddenly appeared here like Yoru did. The church didn't lock me up either. For as long as I can remember, I've been waking and up and sleeping in this, that room. I don't remember having to look for housing like Yoru did. We're the same, but different. I see, that definitely sounds like you, Saiko. You think so? If it were me, I'd be so curious. I'd start hurdling a bar barrage of questions at her. And then you'd use that as material for your next epic tale, huh? Hey, cut it out. You know, I've never really thought about it. But maybe it's okay for roommates to know at least that much about each other. I don't really know that much about Yoru. I'm sure the world is full of things that people just won't talk about unless asked properly about them. Maybe Yoru's just waiting for me to ask her questions. Maybe I'm not asking her anything makes me unworthy in her eyes. And to be even a more useless roommate, here I am spending night after night at some strange man's home. No, it's not like that at all. I'm sure Yoru is interested in talking. As soon as I decide to ask her, as, as soon as I decide to ask her, as soon as I get back. Yeah, I some of the wording is weird. I, I don't know if it's like translation issue. Like it's gotta be right, but still, it's kinda weird. Uh you know, like as soon as I decide to ask her as soon as I get back. Why would you say it as soon it's redundant? I start to look forward to seeing her again, and thus I grow impatient at a weight become excruciating. Yeah, it's nothing too big, it just like happens on occasion and it's kinda funny to see. But it's the small details that counts, especially in a game visual novel where l reading is literally all you do. Or crying if you're playing House in Fata Morgana, because the game is so goddamn good. But yeah, it's kind of funny to see like, you know, this type of uh, translation in, in this game. I guess it kind of got lost. 
So yeah, now we are skipping, I guess, where we're going to your room. Let's see what's up. <laughs> this guy is typing really fast, your average redditor, by the way. As I worry about your development proceeds smoothly. The flesh and soul develop concurrently, and they constantly act on each other. With that declaration, Alexei depend spends half his time tinkering with the parts, and the other half typing at his keyboard. The motion test advances from right to the left hand, and then from the upper body to the lower body, down to the toes. It's almost like it happens in fast forward. It really makes me feel awestruck at how far science has progressed, like Ranger Spider, except without an Im the imminent danger. A single man is handed is a single man is single-handedly carrying out a project to recreate a human in the comfort of his home. Has culture really progressed that far? Can a human be recreated as easily as somewhat intricate hobbyist diorama? Actually, on second thought, Alexei is just an outlier. But if he's this skilled at engineering, why does he work as a movie theater projectionist? Maybe it's just because all the ghosts seem to be somewhat reserved when it comes to work. Alexei decided that today will be her first outing, but out in this game just means out in front of the house. Now that the full body unit test is complete, he wants to install a temporary personality file and check for any movement issue. Uh, what the hell is that? I push her car. I push her on a cart. Her black skeletal frame is exposed. Her head crudely replaced with a speaker. She looks less like mo a mock human and more like an uncanny piece of art. Alexei moved the test stop ahead of schedule to today, since the snow just so happened to stop, thereby minimizing the risk of the damage to the parts. Okay, let her down over there. I let her down from the cart as instructed after Anya and the cleaning robot sweep away the snow at the designated location. As previously instructed, I insert the cable into the port on the back of her neck and hand the other end over to Alexei. I advise you to step back a bit. There's no guarantee there won't be any malfunctions. She got some ridiculous horsepower and you never know if an arm will come flying off. Alexei plugs the cable into a laptop and starts typing away on the keyboard. Okay, good girl. Lizzie does it. Here we go. Beep boop. A sound of reminiscent of very primitive computer rings out, presumably from temporary speaker head. A few seconds later... Welcome to... the Park. Strangely enough, it's a friendly old man voice that rings out. Uh, what park? I didn't catch the name since it was covered with noise. Please enjoy your day. If you need any help, just call on me, mister. We got fun games to play. The corporation has limit sale on... What? Oh. What is this? It's probably a robot routine for an amusement park or shopping mall. I bought it from the salvagers. It should be perfect for a motion test. Huh. The salvagers? I miss them. I wonder how they're doing. They weren't bad guys. Mr. Watts' face, what is speaker, slowly takes a step forward, then another in an awkward walk cycle. With each step, the attached cable gets tighter and tighter until it snaps off, but it doesn't stop walking. Oh, so that wasn't power cable? I think it's more like a charging data cable. It should, so ba it should be basically wireless outside of charging. I mean, there's not really a point in a robot that can't move it out of the cable, is there? You've got a point. The more the robot walks, the more stable its walk cycle becomes. The robot then waves its hand at each of us and starts jumping up and down. Her body comes equipped with all standard functionality, so it should be able to run software made for other machines using the same standards out of the box. What do you think? Amazing, right? Uh, just say amazing. Amazing. Ha. Huh. I think I'm starting to get used to talking with these two. Whenever Alexi says something incomprehensible, Anya gives me notes to help me respond properly. None of us are the type who hate silence, so there's no need to awkwardly look for something for something to talk about. This isn't bad. Sayako, Anya! I turn around so quickly, it's embarrassing. There's Yoru, running this way from the telephone pole over there. She came here to see us. She must have been lonely too. Either that, or she ran into some sort of problem. Or maybe she found a new partner and came to hand me the divorce papers. Anything but that. Long time no see you too. Hey, a familiar girl is running alongside her. I didn't notice her because she was in Yoru's shadow. That's Clara. Why is that thing with you? My whole body freezes over and my legs go numb. 
I realize my right hand in my pocket, unconsciously gripping my gun. I catch Yoru in my arms when she runs in for a hug. Yoru. How you been, Sayako? He hasn't been bullying you, has he? I'm fine. Uh, what's with the girl behind you? I ran into her along the way. She wanted to see you, Sayako. Uh, along the way? Yeah, I just ran into her along the way. No other reason. Honest, I'll even treat... Honest, I'll even treat you to dinner if you can prove otherwise. It's not like I was accusing you of anything. Look, I didn't go out of my way to see her, okay? Uh, have you two already gone that far? Saiko and I are both going steady. <sighs> what are you talking about? Don't make things confusing. My body still feels cold, but I'll probably be okay. It doesn't seem like things have changed in my absence. Wow, how cute. Did you make this yourself? Yeah, this girl hasn't changed either. Uh, yeah, this is indeed my creation. Wow, amazing. You must be a genius inventor. I wouldn't go as far as to call myself a genius. Why do, guy why do guys go gaga over girls like that? Beats me. Clara just as Clary as ever today, and demonstrating boundless energy. That's so unbelievable, it's kind of gross. She keeps letting out cute noises at random. Huh. Can I play with this robot? Uh, as long as you're gentle. Nice to meet you, I'm Clara. I'm an apprentice nun at the church. My hobby is talking with people and helping out in any way I can. Clara is so sweet. Clara bows. That reminds me, she did bow to me, too. Huh. I've known her for longer than I thought, unfortunately. Hello, young lady. Would you like to play a game with? Let's play the game. Whoa, a game! Let's play! Alright, since you're a robot... Clara rummages through her bag and takes out some sort of can. What? Here you go, a drink for robots. What is that? Yeah, that is a bucket thing. That's a can of fuel. A pretty expensive one at that. It's used for generators and motorcycles. Is it really a drink for robots? Of course not. Can't drink without a mouth. Wait, she wouldn't even walk around with that thing in her bag. That's dangerous. She shouldn't. Yoru hums to herself. Clara's waiting for the robot to take the can of fuel and drink it like it's a can of soda or something. Go ahead. Feel free to think it to commemorate our getting to know each other. Oh. Beep. A robotic buzzer instantly causes the relaxed mood to tense up. Hostile behavior detected from real life form in possession of hazardous material. The possession of hazardous material in this facility is a direct violation of the Anti-Terrorism Act. All defense measures are now permitted. Hey Alex, the hell this about? I don't know, I didn't write this personality routine, but I think I got an idea. Please here to state your nine-digit national defetation number and repeat it. Maybe it's a shinobi. I've only ever heard rumors about them. Oh, whoa. Doesn't ring a bell. It turned into a ninja. I'm sorry, can you explain? There's an urban legend that hidden among the general purpose companion robots at the malls and conviction. There are certain numbers of shinobi robots programmed to seek out spies and kill them. Like sort of secret police. Kill the robots, that's not good. You gotta stop it. I repeat, please state your national identification number. It's too late, damn it. Security robots aren't consumer goods, they're military grade. You don't want carriers hacking something like that. So they're completely shut off from external command. I'm only able to get a gist of what Alex is saying, but I guess the machine has identified Clara as a terrorist and now about to attack her. Why didn't you notice before you activate it? How was I supposed to know it was an imposter routine, damn it? Looks like shutting it down won't be as easy as turning off a computer. You idiot, don't shoot! You got any better ideas? This is your final warning. You say you said you state your national identification number. I'm sorry, how do I apologize? <laughs> Clara. Activating defense routine. Have a safe day. <laughs> oh, he is. Eek. As soon as the robot finishes talking, she uses her metallic left hand to knock that can out of Clara's hand. Actually, let me rephrase that. She wrecks Clara's hand so hard, she can't even hold the can anymore. Her wrist is bent at a natural angle. The robot then reaches for Clara next with her right hand. Ah! Ooh. Clara suddenly goes quiet, probably because her neck has been crushed. The robot then dangles her in the air. And poor Clara! Weapon not found. She, or rather, the shinobi, speaks as left hand clatters. It was probably intending to finish Clara off with a standard issue weapon usually installed on left arm. Oh, come on. 
I kick its clattering left arm. Oh. But man, is that thing hard. I guess I should have expected it since it's basically an iron pole. I shake my head and try to regain my focus. Weapon not found. Terrorist backup detected. Weapon not found. Looks like my effort weren't wasted at least. The shinobi let go of Clara. Thank goodness. Alexei didn't install any weapons. In fact, it doesn't look like the shinobi even realized it's not in the body it's supposed to be in. While its repeated error statements are annoying, they're also kind of sad. I'm no terrorist, but come at me. The shinobi responds by letting out a static roar from its head and speaker before tearing up some fallen scrap metal and brandishing it like a sword. Whoa. The speaker headed, the speaker headed killing machine raises its rudimentary sword as it lunges at me. It's hard to believe it's made of metal based on how light its movements are. But what's not light is the weight swings that thing down. I wouldn't want to get hit by that. Sayako. Anya tosses me a road sign that has been cut off at its base. In fights like these, the longer reach, the better. I swing wide and parry the shinobi swing. Come at me. I carefully ward off each and every swing. I, it may be fast, but it's nothing I can't keep up with. But more importantly, in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a human, or rather, a ghost opponent, the advantage goes to it whoever has the most endurance and stamina. But I'm up against a robot. I may be fine now, but how long can I keep this up? I know the negative thinking will just distract me and expose me to further risk, but I can't just unthink these thoughts. It's no use. I need to go on the offensive, instead of holding the shorter end of the road sign and prioritize small quick swings. I shift my grip and hold the sign out as long as I can to take advantage of the centrifugal force. As a result, I don't have the time to adjust how different it feels swinging it before the next attack comes. Instead of simply warding off the attack, this time I swing back as hard as I can, focusing as much strength as I can into my arms and my grip to withstand the impact of the collision. The iron plate of the, ro the road sign starts to work. Perhaps thanks to the help of centrifugal force, the effect of the impact is way more than just even. The enemy retreats with a few nimble backflip as if it's forgotten that it's made of metal. Huh. So I take another swing. It can defend against the attack, sure, but the ground underfoot too unstable to completely cushion the impact. So with plenty of leeway, I take another large swing. Now that it's lost its posture, I can neither dodge or block pro uh, properly. It may be a machine, but the sheer weight of the road sign attack is too much for it to take as I knock away its metal uh, shard sword. Now that it's defenseless, one less attack should be enough to... Stop! Alexei shouts. I reflectively, I reflexively freeze in place. The shinobi doesn't miss its opportunity to quickly make some distance. Please don't destroy her. It's not her anymore, you idiot. It's a killing machine. It could kill you too. I can't just let you destroy the one person who loves me. Bruh. This thing doesn't love you, at least not yet. It's not even complete. At the very least, that's a body that will be hers. If this project succeeds, how do you expect me to look at her without thinking about how I destroyed her body once in order <clears throat> to protect myself? I couldn't live with myself. Having lost its weapon, the Shinobi comes at me with a bare fist now. It's already fast moving and feel even faster. Can't you compromise at least a little? You know, I wanted to be perfect. I found someone to love, and I need my love to be more perfect than anyone else here. It looks like the enemy hasn't gotten faster, but I've just gotten tired. I know that the reason nobody loves me because there's nobody I love. I value myself, but I'm like other people. I can't value someone else. I never wanted to. I like to speak in this straight and nasally voice. His enunciation is so bad it's hard to catch the word he's saying, but I think I can get what he's trying to say. <laughs> Everyone instinctively sees that, which is why uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't care. I, I really don't care. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip his dialogue, it's so bad. I swing the road sign in a wide horizontal sweep, but the shinobi dodges by bending backwards. Okay, fine. I toss away my weapon too. I lost some reach and power, but I gain maneuverability. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to lie, uh, but I want to love. I want to be loved, damn it. You just don't understand. I barely managed to keep toe to with the shinobi. I may be tough, but there's no telling what metal fist uh, to the vitals will do to me. That white's always clicking on the right hook. That's why I made her. 
I tried taking out my gun, sharding freeze. An idea so crazy, it might just... Yeah. I don't know. Or rather, it did worse than nothing. As a shinobi kicks my gun out of my hand, so I've lost my trump card. I'm pretty sure this is all Alexis' fault. I don't want to hear your complaining. Just how much longer must we bend to your will? We don't hate you as much as you think we do. So why can't you just let go? Enough complaining. It seems like to me like the only reason you can love her is because she's a part of you and you know that. Maybe you're right, but maybe not. I'll never know until I try. I guess he's got a point. I get it. My wish is full of contradictions. I know that, but please, you're my only hope. Dude, what? what? God, actually, I don't really get it. Oh, bruh. Oh my god, I can't. I can't. I, this dialogue is cringe. I'm skipping cringe. Please stop her without hurting her. You're so selfish, you stinky poophead. What? Fine, whatever. Guess I'll run as much as I can. I turn my back to the shinobi and retreat. I'm sure that thing will chase after me. I think things out as I run. Maybe the battery will even run out in the meantime. Oh, it's good to analyze your issues. You're showing signs of improvement. How wonderful. I get distracted by Yoru's voice. My feet stop for a moment. Retreat failed. I use both my hands to guard against the, a, heavy a heavy kick. But you might be hoping for a bit too much. Okay. What's Yoru talking about? Is she trying to do counseling here? If her strategy is to convince Alexi to let me destroy this thing, then I approve. If so, I suppose I can bear it a little a bit longer. Yoru gives me a wink. Uh, I don't understand what's that supposed to mean. <laughs> Mr. Alec, you're well versed in the Shinobi program in a working. <laughs> no, of course not. I mean, I just think about what kind of program it is. <laughs> Look at the log. This line here has been sending the same request at fixed intervals, but it always fails, and it's been returning to this error measure. <laughs> then do you want to know what this means? No, how could I? There's no way I can tell you what the function does just by looking at it. I'm trying to communicate... <clears throat> it's trying to communicate with the headquarters. If there's a terrorist attack in one place, there's a possibility there are multiple other attacks happening simultaneously, right? That's why it's been trying to contact CD headquarters in incessantly every second. As if it's waiting for the command to abandon its post at a tiny insignificant mall and go defend an important person or place. I see, how did you know? No, more importantly, are, we su are you suggesting we attack from that angle? That's right, now that it changed mods, I don't think it will accept normal commands, but this is an exception. The code changes at fixed intervals, but since it's offline, we can go at as much as we want by sending the shot of command with a little signal proofing. The shinobi will mistake it as a command from the mission control, huh? Okay, but how do we spoof the signal? That's where you come in. You can do it, can't you? I sure can, I'm a genius, kinda. Yeah, sure? Sayako, hang in just a little longer. Hey, give me that back. Yoru pulls something off his hand and tosses it my way. I see. This is the thing. Alexei used the first time we met. Oh, uh, okay. The otaku guard, was it? If you ask me, it needs a better name. Should get Pacific or someone to think about something. Of something? I see Pacifica face in the back of my mind. I want to have coffee with her again sometime. What? Oh, what a random dialogue. It's like a nine-year-old kid wrote it. I want to have coffee with her in like the middle of a fight. Dude, what? A moment before the shinobi punch lands, the guard thin outline envelops me. Not a scratch. The shinobi stumbles back a step, as if to ascertain what exactly blocked his attack. I find myself impressed by the cautiousness, though maybe I'm just amused that my codename, Ninja, is synonymous with the codename Shinobi. Yo, what, what is that music? Something happened to my volume? Why, why is it so goddamn loud? It, sh it should be on 10. Okay, there we go. Ah, oh, no, it's still kind of loud. Damn it, is this it? Nah, is this it? No, no, yes, okay, come on. Which the point? I dare to shut off the guard, hold my, out my open palms, and beckon the shinobi to come at me. <laughs> I got it, just a little more. There's no way shinobi will miss the fact that I'm way open. It leaps at me as if in recogni recognition that this is tense and victory. <laughs> guard on. I activate the guard at the very last moment before those middle fingers reach me. The guard deflects the enemy. 
The unexpected rebound causes the shinobi to lose its footing. With one leg up in the air, I quickly shot off the guard and tried to trip up the shinobi remaining pivotless. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, with a sweeping kick. Nice. Please work! But the shinobi may have lost its footing, its legs are still just bare metal pole. And I just kicked one of them with my shin. I may be a ninja, but my legs still made of flesh and bone. I wasn't expecting it to be easy, but still. Yeah, not a great idea. I arrived in pain, forgetting to reactivate the guard, my lifeline. My hatred for the entire world is the only thing keeping my consciousness together. I hate everything. Yes, even Yoru, who suddenly sounded like a computer expert, despite never him even once hinting that she know a thing about them. Wait, what's up with that anyway? No, more importantly, what about the shinobi? I find the shinobi fallen over, still motionless, in the corner of my eye. I see Alexi glistening in cold sweat as he gives me a thumbs up. I did it. I did it. I really am a genius. How's that, you dumbass? Trying my best to ignore that noise violation, I instead turned to the Yoru for explanation. Yo, what happened back there? <clears throat> Alright, what happened? Clara, I wonder if she's okay. She's clearly dodging the question, but now that she mentions Clara, we all remember that she... Uh, she's what set this whole scuffle into motion. Anya goes off to check on her. The rest of us follow behind. <laughs> if Clara's alive, I wonder if we can charge the church a rescue fee. It wouldn't change the fact that we've gotten her killed several times over. Ah, it is possible to live with your neck like this? As she asks that question, Anya shows Clara, or perhaps I should say her corpse. No rescue fee for us, I guess. I let out a dry chuckle. Ah, man, poor Clara. All they're doing is dirty. Is that, is that a corpse? Ugh. Bruh. Upon seeing Clara corpse, Alexi turns pale, takes several steps backwards. Oh, what a voice crack. And starts vomiting. That's what Alexi is causing me. Cringe and voice cracking. But apart from her oddly bent neck, she looks perfectly fine. At least nothing's spilling out of her or anything. Are you not used to seeing corpses? This guy's a shot in the sea. Uh, it's you guys who are the freaks. Well, to be honest, I do agree with him on this part. On this part, you know, particular thing. Honestly, there's not much difference between a corpse and what this guy's trying to make. But I'm sure there are totally different things in his mind, and I guess that's good enough for now. Don't worry, I'll take this thing someplace else. No, there's something I want to ask you, Yoru. That's right. I can't let this opportunity pass. I need to ask Yoru herself. Please, please get rid of it. Look, I like getting impatient too. Then I'll come with you. Okay then, let's go. Tell us the truth, Yoru. The two of us head away from the amusement park and go all the way to the outer limit of town. Where's a good place to get rid of this thing anyway? Wherever you think is a good place. Then let's go just a little bit further if that's okay with you, Yoru. Yeah, it's fine. I want to give those two some time together too. Good idea. It sure is. We walk a bit more after that conversation. If you look back, you can see a full, sprawling view of the town. It reminds me of the view I once shared with Yoru back at the top floor of the church, though the angle is completely different. Each light in town tells the ghost who lives there. There are a lot of worthless, good-for-nothing ghosts, but there are also ghosts that I like, even if they sometimes cause explosion with weird science experiments. A freezing wind blows. Ooh, and that's cold. It sure is. I guess we should get back quickly. Why don't we light a bonfire, Psycho? It's way too cold. Oh, I've got matches. I also got a lot to talk about. Ah, finally! Finally! Yoru's eyes look straight through mine. Her eyes go from anxious panic to confident determination. I nod. It's exactly what you think, Yoru. I don't feel bad at all. I just feel a little bit ticklish that she's seeing through me. I do want to talk, but we don't have to anything to burn. There's not even trash around here. I casually glance at Clara corpse and then look back at Yoru. She shrugs. No, don't do it. I shrug back and let go of the corpse. Bruh. No way. No way you're gonna do it dirty like that. That is way too much. When the corpse flops into the ground, a large can rolls out of Clara's coat pocket. Oh right, the can of fuel. She was trying to give this thing to the robot, wasn't she? Oh, how convenient. Yoru murmurs. Oh no. I'm so glad you came, Yoru. Psycho? Bonfire lit. Discover the fun of pyromancy. That's the achievement. Your whispers. Your looks like she caught on to the fact that I'm going to ask what I haven't asked all the time. She knows she'll have to answer. 
I'm the one who brought Yoru out here, so I'm the one who has to start off the discussion. We work together and time off, we hang out with people we know. When we get home, we chat before we go to sleep. It's a little questionable that we share the same bed, but there's only one bed and two of us. I speak from the heart. If I want Yoru to expose everything about herself, I should expose myself to her, too. At least, that's how I feel. Exposing your, ourself to each other. Yes, that's the showing skin thing that Yoru once brought up. I use that logic to encourage myself, because otherwise, I'd be too scared to push forward, I'm sure. I've always hated this town. I've always wanted to go home. I tell myself that even I can string my thoughts in a coherent order. If I just say everything I need to say, she'll understand how I feel. Also, I always felt bad not knowing when why ghosts even exist, so with Pacifica and Anya help, I tried to leave the town. Though, for some reason, I don't really remember what happened back then. It's an especially vague memory of mine. Pacifica and Anya were my friends back then too. We were trying to get to the outside world just like we are now. I'm pretty sure it was my desire to go home that motivated us back then. Yes, back then. To be honest, now that I have you, I don't feel like I need to go back to where I was before. As long as I've got you, and Pacifica, and Anya, I don't mind being here. Back then, I really wanted to go home. But now, I feel like I got a place, like I belong here. But I haven't done anything. I shake my head. I die for you. How can I say that with a straight face? I don't want you to die, Psycho. I can feel the blood rushing to my neck a moment late. I won't die, I'm a ghost after all. That's just a standard ghost joke. I try to plaster on a smile to hide my embarrassment, but only end up with a half-twitching face. I give up and take a deep breath. The cold air stings my nose. I can feel tears welling up in my eyes. I killed those two. I shot him with my gun, probably on purpose. I pull out my gun and point it at your room, trying to remember how it felt back then. From the snippets of my memory that I do recall, I feel I can remember the fear of shooting the gun and the surprise at the recoil. Did it not really happen? Yoru keeps listening to me without faltering at the slightest. The few of us won't try to get out of the city. We used the same car as before. Things were going smoothly at first, but I think. But then, something happened. Something that since gotten hazy. Despite all that happened back then, Pacifica and Anya said they'll help me try again. And that's not all. They fuss over me so much, they even brought you into my life, Yoru. It's not that I want to go home, I just want to go further than we did last time, with everyone. They did all that for me and I killed them, there must be some reason why I thought it was the right thing to do. I feel like I need to find out that reason. But Sayako, you must just end up repeating what happened last time. I feel that that same thing won't happen if I got you, Yoru. So I'd like to ask you again, will you please come with me? I can't do anything. I just need your presence, Yoru. I've already shot you once before, haven't I? I feel like everything will be okay if you're with me. I know there's no reason to believe it, but that's just how strongly I feel about you. Okay. And what sort of feelings do you have for me? What? Special. Yes, I feel like you're special to me, Yoru. Yes, that's right. Oh. I see. So I'm special. Ah, I'm happy to hear it. Thank you. I wasn't happy at all being called special before, but when you say it, it makes my heart feel so warm, Sayoko. Just Yoru snuggles up against me as she says that. She seems so childish despite being quite a bit bigger than me. She certainly feels warm like a child too. Sayoko, you said you didn't understand why you ghosts even exist, right? Yoru speaks while still clinging to me. All I can see is her head, so her voice draws in even more of my attention. Uh, probably. I know even less about who or what I am, or why I am, so we're similar in that regard. You wouldn't happen to know who I am either, would you, Sayako? Uh, sorry, I don't. True, this time just full of things we don't know. What a mess, huh? You're always making it sound like she's not one of us. Is she not a ghost? So, as a result, I was a little confused at first, like, why do I have to be here? I was wondering if there was some way to quit this whole time, and that's when someone from the church approached me. Quit what, exactly? I think back to the story from the insane castle you talked about. This town is a prison. There are several jailers among us to observe. Now, nah, that can't be a disredacu- that's ridiculous. 
I really can't do anything. I'm not strong like you. I'm not cool like Pacifica, and I'm not handy like Anya. But you were amazing just earlier today, weren't you? That was just because I knew what was going on. I was confident because I had prior knowledge. At first, I wasn't motivated to step in at all. That project was, ju was just in such bad taste. I figured it'd be for the best if you just tore that thing to pieces, Sayoko, but... It'd be a little out of character for you to say that, huh? You ever smile and continue? I noticed that Alec really treasures that girl. I tried putting myself in his shoes and got really scared, and before I knew it, I set myself into motion without thinking. I don't think anyone could have done what you did without thinking honestly. There's nothing amazing about applying knowledge to you just so happen to have. No, it's amazing, I'm seriously curious. Okay, tell us. I still do know things that you don't, Psycho, but I can't do anything. There's nothing I can do to help you. Even if I told you everything I know, it wouldn't make you happy, Psycho. <clears throat> we won't know that until you tell me. To tell the truth, I'm a tiny bit different than you and the other ghost, Psycho. I can tell you a little about this town, but there's, but there's no point. It wouldn't amount to anything. I listen intently to what you're saying, every single word of it. I try to swallow those words and process them, but I can't digest any of it. There are many things that I don't know either, like how the church noticed me. At first, I thought I'd eventually understand what I am, but in the end, I still don't know. But there were some good things, though. <clears throat> Yoru stops clinging to me and looks me straight on. You appeared out of the blue and rescued me. You sat next to me and you even gave me a name as a present. How could I not be happy? I felt like I had no choice but to stick with you forever. As your reminisces, her eyes sparkle with a passionate light. It's almost as if the bonfire isn't the only fire burning here. Uh, yeah, I don't care. She's so dazzling. It wasn't that big deal. I'll go with you, Psycho, whenever you go, but... Wherever you go. But what? Your turns are back to me. I look up to find her looking at the city at the nightscape. For a second, I almost start to think there's nobody left to leave this light. The city in the nightscape means completely different things to me and Yoru. It's a little bit sad to think about. She and I are different. The, the two of us are actually quite distant from each other, but only just so happy to be physically close right now. Just thinking about like that's making me want to cry. You see, Psycho, the truth is, there are things in this world that are more meaningless than you think. Yo, just say it! Stop it all the babbling. Some things are just nonsense that seem true, and you might just be getting your hopes up for nothing. Uh, okay. Is that still okay with you? Will you still stay with me? That question is surely an important one for both me and for Yoru. I wish I could put a stop to her tears on command. Of course I do. I walk around the oldest back so I can see her face to face. I gaze right into her eyes. Of course. I get it. You don't have to say it twice. I hesitate to talk back. I don't think there's anything I can really tell you, Psycho. Oh, no way. No way. Oh my god, you're so nice. That's not true. Anyway, let me just ask you this one thing. I remember what Anya said earlier. I'm free to come up with my own theories, aren't I? Yoru. I call her by her name. Her name's Yoru because I met her at night. It's really a dumb, lazy name that I just came with up with on the spot. But before I knew it, it's a name I run to love. Yoru, are you a human? Yoru's eyes open wide after moments of silence. A human? Well, there have been times where I've thought it'd be nice to be human. Am I a human? I never thought I'd ask that. It's not a funny question, is it? I squat down next to the bonfire, embarrassed. Sorry, but even if I'm not human, that doesn't change the fact that I want to be a trusty roommate forever, Sayako. You're not trusty at all, though. Huh. There must be something behind the scenes of this town that's sure to make me sad. Let's go back, Psycho. But now's not time for me to know what it is. Oh, boy. I'm a ghost and she's, uh, well, I'm not sure what she is, but at the very least, she's not a human. The two of us walk together in the snow. Once we're back, the strange man is working desperately on his robot. Today's another strange day. I wonder if there are any humans out there who knows about these strange happenings. I suddenly notice the sky turning white in the distance. Another day come to a close. Another day out of eternity. Holy, that, <laughs> that was so bad. That is such a bad writing. I honestly, I'm about to fall asleep. That is a six-year-old writing. I have no idea who wrote this, but this is the worst dialogue I've seen in my entire life. 
Oh my god, I wish it's like, it was like at least comically bad so it was funny. But that's just garbage. I, that is straight up trash. Okay, how's this please work? One second later, Alexei clacks the enter key on his keyboard. I shoot a glance at Anya who's sitting next to him. I plug my ears with my index fingers. Why does this keep happening? Thanks to my makeshift earplug, I don't have to expose my ear to Alexi shrieks directly. After several repetitions of the cycle, I've learned how to deal with it. Everything was going smoothly uh, up until the body movement test. Both Alexi and Anya said as much, and they never looked like they had reached a dead end. However, ever since that little violent incident and my subsequent conversation with Yoru, progress just hasn't been going well. That said, it's not because of damage to the parts during the scuffle or anything. In fact, the only damage I managed to inflict with your help was some minor uh, warping of the leg frame. Rather, the issue here is that once the hardware implementation was mostly complete, Alexi went to do software test, but then the hole in the ghost pocket effect caused Alexico to disappear. Ever since we started coming here, less has been disappearing and at lower, at lower frequency, but nonetheless, things are still disappearing one by one on the software side, which is causing Alexi headaches. Since we can see the parts, we can consciously be aware of their existence and presence, but programs have no physical form and are, no in and are incomprehensible to us, so it's hard to be aware of them, at least that's the theory to why the code keeps disappearing. But Alexei just cynically said, I just have to write the code faster than it disappears and spend days on end typing up a storm programming. However, with every test, some part of the program would go missing and the entire unit would stop moving, causing him disappointment, despair, and... Ah, damn it. He screams shamefully. Maybe things would have gone better if Yor didn't go home. I pull my fingers out of my ears and speak to Anya. I don't know, it's not like we can force her to stay, though. True, but still. After our bonfire conversation, Yoru walked back with me to Alexia's house, but she had this say to say about this project. I just can't support it no matter what, I'm sorry. She declined to help and instead went back home. I didn't stop her, of course. And that brings us to the present. The Moodle Lab isn't good, but I'm optimistic. Somehow, I just know they'll find a solution. Alexei just that skilled of an engineer. That portable otaku guard was a pretty high quality piece of tech after all. The front doorbell rings. That's the first time I've heard that sound from the inside. It feels more formal than the doorbell at my place. I'll go answer it. Anya trots off to the entrance, leaving the hallway door open. Ah! For some reason, Anya Yelp gives me a deja vu. Alright, oh, it's like when you first met Clara. Is she back? Since it's a big house, the entrance is far away, so I can't make out what they're talking about. I decide to wait. Oh. I regret my optimism when several seconds later, men wearing coats march into the lab. <laughs> Alexei, could you come with us for a moment? There's five men, large men. I can deal with them while protecting Alexei and Anya at the same time. I grind my, I grind my teeth. Hey, what are you accusing Alexei of? Anya rushes in after the men. You are abusing technology in order to blaspheme God, are you not? The man who appears to be a leader uh, presses Alexei with a firm voice. He glares at Alexei. I can't help but follow his gaze and look at him too. He already looked pale due to stress and lack of sleep. But now he looks even paler. He's even whiter than a ghost. He reminds me of the... I don't care. How did you know? We have eyes everywhere. Anya jumps in front of the man as if to shield Alexei from those eyes. Hey, Alexei's free to research whatever he wants in his free time, isn't he? I back her up without a moment's delay. That's right. What? That's right. What right does the church have to complain? The church must be stepping in due to my involvement. I thought things had calmed down lately, but I've just. But maybe I've been just too careless. I've just been too careless. Either way, it's too late to regret it now. I will answer your questions in order. First, this man is technically an official follower of the church. While he's not a church-going believer, he's still our brother, and since he is our brother, we must have him adhere to our customs. Is that true? Yes, it is true. I am a follower. I understand. I'll come with you. But these ladies... Alexei. Anya shouts. Alexei shouts up. The man quickly interjects in the ensuing silence. 
Do not take us for liars. As for your other question, this many workplace, the movie theater, as well as the amusement park, are both subdivided by the church. The workers are also followers of the church, though this fact is not well known. I can hear Anya murmuring that she didn't know that. This man is both follower of the church and was given employment by the church, and yet he associates with a ninja that opposes the church. We thus have a right to complain about his actions, do we not? Mr. Alexei, if you kill them all... Alexei hold out his hand, his hand out to refuse my suggestion. It's okay, I wasn't expecting this position, but this might be a test from God. Miss Inquisitor, may I speak to the priest during my trial? The priest is a compassionate man. I'm sure you will listen to your words, no matter how asinine they may be. Okay, I see. Alexei approaches the man with his hands raised. The two of the men immediately frisk him. There's a gun in my pocket. If I personally do not think the enemy have a fair odds of overall success, though not without sacrifices. But it looks like this is Alexei's problem, if anything. If that's the case, then I've got no reason to needlessly kill these men. Well, I'll be back, eventually. In my moment of hesitation, the men quickly drag Alexei away. We stand stock still, uh, stock still in shock in the silent room. He protected her, didn't he? Anya murmurs, what do you, as I tried to ask, but since my throat dry, it comes out weird. What do you mean? He probably didn't want to draw the attention to his creation by resisting or protesting. Otherwise, they might have destroyed her. Oh, how shrewd. Yeah, he really is shrewd. He might say that he can't love or be loved, but I think he's got some character in that regard. Maybe you're right. He could really use some more confidence, though. Anya laughs weakly before letting out a big sigh. Say, Sayako. Anya gazes into my eyes and carefully chooses her words. I know it might be shameless of me, but there's something I'd like to ask you. I get impatient to ask her, her question for her. Do you want me to save Alexi? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, blah, blah. Hey, hold on, Anya. You don't have to pay me. When Anya casually starts bringing up the question of money, I frankly just it won't be necessary. But I'm asking you for an unreasonable favor, and this isn't even your problem to begin with, Sayaka. When I invited the church, you brought out the armored vehicle to come rescue me, and I didn't pay you then. I just be kind of wanted to. I never really is a good girl. I know it for a fact, and I feel it with my heart. I'm sorry. I know I sound weird right now. Maybe she's even too good. I feel like her dedication is going a bit overboard in this whole ordeal. This isn't your problem to solve, Anya. You're not a ninja, and you, do n and you don't do whatever it is Pacifica does. But despite all that, you're always doing your best and putting yourself in danger. You're so reliable. Uh, really? That's why uh, I just want to, to pay back the favor. I always want to thank you for everything you do. But just saying thank you feels half-hearted. So I never get to say it. I'm running out of air in my lungs, so I take a deep breath before I continue. As you know, there are very few things I'm good at, but I want you to rely on me more. I'll do anything I can for you, Anya. I start running out of the room. I need to chase after those men. The Inquisitors, I believe. I once heard... I stop at the sound of Anya's words. I once heard from a shithead woman who is that sort of crowd. She said, that's just a group of outcasts. That's the lonely girl just trying to force herself to find a place she belongs and nerve her. Anya's voice is full of rage. I don't know the finer details of that interaction, interaction, but I can bet it was incredibly frustrating. I mean, sure, we may have just won the group because we didn't fit into any other groups. In fact, I definitely think that was the case. But so what? Is it wrong to associate with like-minded peers? But it's not like we forced ourselves to group up out of desperation, you know. That's why that's why I've made up my mind. This time, it's Anya's turn to run out of breath as she gets her air. I decide to pressure my friends as much as I can so that I won't be embarrassed no matter who sees us. If I do that, then nobody can tell me we're only friends out of necessity, you know? So, shit, I'm so uncool right now, I told myself to never talk about this. The tears welling up in Anya's eyes seems almost infectious as tears starts to form in my eyes as well. Maybe it's because Anya is so overwhelmingly precious and I don't know how else to express it. Why are you crying? Come on. You're crying too, Anya? And thus, we both cry. I guess when it's just the two of us, without Pacific or your run, we're just, our, we're just a couple of crybabies. Weeping together like this feels so girly and dumb, and yet it's so satisfying. 
Once the tears have mostly stopped, I give Anya a thumbs up and speak up. I'm off. I'm counting on you. Leave it to me. I sniff as I run. My nose stops dripping. I fling open the front door and dash into the snowy outdoors. Okay. Uh, it's not too hard to catch up to men who are walking. Thankfully, since we are on the outskirts of town, there aren't many buildings to obstruct the view. Thanks to the fuel that is Anya, simple, era, earnest friendship. I'm filled with boundless energy, unlike anything I've felt before. Basically, it feels a little comically overdramatic as Block the Man Puffle, ninja like. Hand over Alexi. You just quietly handed him over a moment ago. Please understand, I'll be okay. Let's just say the situation has changed. Shoot him! I pull my gun at the lead inquisitor. We're off to a good start. Where are. Oh. So you've changed your mind, I see. Do you intend to take this man back, even if it requires the use of force? Well, I suppose you could say that. The Inquisitor takes a black, rectangular object out of his pocket. I can't help but gasp. No sudden movements. I recognize what is the Inquisitor out. A transceiver. Do it. I don't know what came first, the sound or the impact. I pull the trigger out of shock. The recoil hits my whole upper body harder than I expected. Causing me to take a few steps back. Why? I thought I had braced my legs better than that. I had a bad feeling as I look over my shoulder behind me. Oh, there's a red blood splattered over the pure white snow. I don't even want to think about it, but I feel my abdomen a little lower than my solar Ugh. Oh, come on. They got me. I've been shot. But nobody in front of me even has a gun out. I'm confused for just a second, then I start to process what happened with surprising composure. I've been sniped. They got a sniper. Fit. I screwed up. I scream out loud in an attempt to maintain indigenous opioid labels in my brain. The pain from a gunshot wound doesn't come immediately. It'll testify as soon as I let my guard down, so I need to keep myself at natural high. If you call yourself a sniper, don't aim for the gun. Go for a headshot. One shot, one go. I shout like an idiot as I use the calm part of my mind to churn off thoughts at high speed. So that's why the Inquisitor acting so smug. I suppose he's already planned out countermeasure for a ninja like me. If the sniper's been watching me this whole time, there'd probably be some inclined to the top of a building like some sort of an action hero. Dude, how embarrassing. They probably had themselves a chuckle looking at me. I wish I could smack them right now, but I don't even know where they are. I, as I think those thoughts, and the snow at my feet burst into the air. I guess that was a warning shot. As in, I can always shoot you again. I make sure I've got still grip on my gun. I say I got grip on my gun, but I'm not sure I can keep holding it for more than a few dozen seconds. My gut bleeding even worse. If I make any movements, I'll only reach my time limit much quicker. I had to admit it, but there's no way I can win. <laughs> go ninja, go, I'll be okay. Alexei hair raising shriek snaps me back in my senses. He's right, I need to get moving. I back away, keeping my sights on the Inquisitor, even if for just formality's sake. I've Once I've got enough distance, I turn around and head under the cover of the building. I find, I find a conveniently placed garbage can to hide behind it. It's better than nothing, at least. I close my eyes. There's no indication that anyone's pursuing me. I guess they don't feel like finishing me off, which is a bit of relief. That said, I don't know where the sniper is, nor do I know if they can still see me. I don't even know if there's only one sniper. Uh, yep, even uh, my sense of time. Yeah, just keep unnecessary dialogue. It's Ninja, are you okay? Oh, it's Clara. My consciousness suddenly snapped back to reality. I recognize that grating, uh, screen voice. It's Clara. Uh, as my consciousness returns, so does my, so does the hot, burning pain of the gunshot wound in my gut. I groan. Hmm. You're badly injured. You need first aid. Thanks to this asshole seeing my wound, the entire disappearing process has been reversed. I'm fine. Just leave me alone. Go do something else. I can't. I need to treat you. There's no point. I'm a ghost after all. Who cares if I die? I care. I found it. After finding bandages or something in her bag, Clara sits down next to me and leans over to inspect my wound. Her surgery scan frustrates me. Clara, why do you care so much about us? It's not like you need to. There's a ton of other people out there who love you. 
There's no deep meaning behind those words. I just want to get through to her that there's no point in getting close to me. <laughs> but the priest told me to... The priest? It was probably some sermon about the importance of friendship or something. What did he say? He said that I was the only one who could save your souls. He said he, ex he expected great things from me. I almost write it off as foolish nonsense before I make a sudden realization. I focus my hazy consciousness and reflect on the word Clara said. Clara, why did you go to Alexia's house? Because the priest told me that you guys were all up to something at the movie project in his house. I can feel my heart start pounding. Did you tell the priest what happened during your visit? I sure did. The priest is nice and gives me a lot of advice. Every day when I hang out with you guys, I always have a friendship review with the priest. She says that. Clara try, tries to stick a bandage on, on my wound. I grab my hand without thinking. The, her hand without thinking. The bandage flutters down to the ground. You consciously did all of that, and yet you still don't understand what is it you've done. Are you kidding me? Why did Clara approach us? Surely it was because she was a simple-minded idiot who felt an odd sense of... Uh, yeah. I don't want to kiss all Clara's a moving wiretap. A breathing surveillance camera sent by the priest. Or in simple words... <laughs> You're a spy. Dude, that was like the most obvious thing you could possibly imagine. Why would you talk to a girl that literally says she's from the church and she's so dumb? What? Word of Alexei's girlfriend spread from Clara to the church. Does the setting the Inquisition in motion? The priest used the power of his fate to raise this thoughtless, almost hopelessly optimistic girl into a splendid spy. I felt that the church had been pretty hands-off lately, but they had actually been surprisingly sour in their surveillance. Come to think of it, when we met Alexei, he was working at the church funded the movie theater, and he's a follower. A bit of a straight one. In that case, it should have been given some sort of co-workers might be a follower too. We watched several of those co-workers walk by as we waited for Alexei. At least one nosy follower must have reported our conversation with Alexei to the church. After hearing that report, the church, that is, the priest, must have had some doubts about it. Around the time the report was made, Anya and I disappeared off to the streets. Uh, of the streets. I guess assume that the priest got word of her disappearance too? With all that evidence filed up, it's only natural that a priest or at least somebody else would come to the conclusion that Alexei working on something with a ninja and the repair workshop apprentice. The church must know about Alexei engineering skill. Furthermore, since he's a heretic, it's only natural that the church would feel threatened by him, potentially leading a violent revolt against its religious authority. At least that's how I think religion worked. Right after we contracted the heretic, we vanished like smoke. That should be enough cause panic in the church. The priest calmly responded to the panic by sending in Clara. After some complication, Clara broke her neck, revived, and returned to the priest to report all the details. Huh. Oh, speaking about Clara breaking her neck, why did she even have that kind of fuel to offer to the robot? Why didn't that raise more alarms with me? Clara... Clara knew we were making something there. Her idea of an appropriate gift was that a can of fuel. I did nothing. I didn't do anything wrong. I let go of her pale, slender wrist. I despise you. Wow. A certain sort of despair drives me to speak in the coldest voice I can manage. Clara has been an irritating pest, but now I realize that somewhere in my heart I had started to grow fond of her semblance of relationship. You insolently hide behind a facade of goodwill as you spread the ill will of others as an intermediary, all the while feigning ignorance to pr protect yourself. I tremble at the thought that it was all a ruse. I'm mad, and maybe a little sad too. You're disgusting, filthy, you're far worse than the priest himself. To berate myself for my own stupidity, I have to act as coldly as possible to do what I need to do. I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. Just the other day I came to help because I was worried about you, remember? I'm not a spy. No, you knew. You just pretended not to. You've been pulling the wool over your over our eyes so your shepherd would praise you like a good little sheep. But you couldn't bear the guilt of deceiving someone so you deceived yourself this whole time. I think the en endogenous opioid labels in my brains are rising again. The pain has faded and all I feel is a boiling heat like magma churning in my stomach. Clara cries pathetically, her nose ripping, but I don't feel a thing watching her. I proceed with the execution. The execution of a relationship. I feel like something similar has happened before. In this town, nobody dies, but if you kill a relationship, they're dead to you. Don't you dare show your face in front of me or my friends ever again. I'm never talking with you again. I won't hurt you. I'll just ignore you. No information for spies. Clara tries to say something, but I cut her off. Go away. 
But I tried so hard. Go away. When I shout, sparks starts to fly in my eyes. Maybe I stained myself I strained myself too much, but can't I can't even hear Clara sobbing anymore, so maybe I'm starting to lose my hearing too. Soon enough, not even my sense of time can drag me down. My consciousness disappears. And that will be all for today's video. And man, I swear, if I wasn't so close to the ending, I would have quit playing this game. This visual novel is so bad. The writing is the worst I've seen in a while. It's like a nine-year-old writing. It is so over the place. Constantly trying to describe emotions is cringe. You need to let us feel it. You can describe it from time to time, and that makes a lot of impact, like they did in, again, Fata Morgana. But when you constantly de describe it to us, like we're idiots, like we're some emotionless boglodites that don't understand feelings, it's weird, and it wastes time of reading. Why would you do this? I do not understand. But yeah, I, st I think I have one more video to go before this game ends, so I'm gonna push everything on tomorrow's video. Just so I can finish this game and call it, but man, oh my god, I have been suffering these past few chapters. Uh, that, that is insane. That is insane. So, hopefully you guys enjoyed watching me kinda, you know, suffer. Because I don't think you enjoyed the story. But if you did, actually let me know in the comments below, because I really do care about what you guys think. But that's all for now. So yeah, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.